excited to be here. Thank you for the excellent introduction, Brittany. And Jono was so amazing. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be like the ginger morning of power. Um, okay, so today I am here to talk about mobile first indexing, and that's awesome, but I'm also excited because there's something kind of special for me, which is this is my fifth consecutive year talking at MozCon, and that's kind of cool for me, because not a lot of people do that. And I think they keep inviting me back because I'm sometimes good at like predicting the future and knowing where Google's going with some of the stuff. So I wanted to start with a quick review. So, so let's review. In 2014, that was my first time here, and I started talking about like just mobile SEO. Like mobile SEO is a thing. Mobile results are different from desktop. Mobile is different from tablet. Mobile is different between Android and iOS. Mobile is just different. Mobile SEO is a valid separate thing, right? Mobile SEO is a thing. Then 2015, I came here and I said mobile friendliness is a thing because Google had pre-announced this update and it was terrifying and we called it mobile get in. And, and so we all had to make sure that our JavaScript and our CSS was crawlable and that, that we were going to get penalized if we didn't get this mobile friendliness tag in the mobile search results. And so that was a thing. And then in 2016, I came here and talked about PWAs. Do you guys remember who was here and heard the, the word PWA for the first time in 2016? And now, like, that's totally a thing, right? Also, we talked about Firebase that year. And if you're building Google Actions or working with Google Assistant or Google Home, that's where Firebase is now. And we talked about Firebase that year. That's a thing. Last year, we talked about mobile-first indexing for the first time. And we made the cow noises. Do you remember that? Moo. Come on. That was fun. You can do it while I'm on stage if you want to, to moo again. Uh, but we talked about things ranking that didn't have URLs and things showing up all over Google results that just didn't have URLs. They just existed and ranked without URLs. And so that was the beginning of mobile-first indexing. And so this year, we're talking about mobile-first indexing again. but. I like to think about mobile-first indexing as entity-first indexing. So this year, entity-first indexing is a thing. And like Brittany mentioned, this is my dog, Barkley. I have an alternate title for this presentation. It is called Barkley and Friends Explain Mobile-First Indexing because I love my dog. And my dog has cool friends. Like there's Brittany and Rand petting my dog in my car. He's and then there's me, and then Barkley's friends with his Mr. Bill toy that goes, oh no, when he takes it. It's a good toy. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, well, no, not yet. We're not going to get into it, because I have a side note. I've always thought that Rand and Barkley were very similar, because they're both like really dapper guys with really amazing hair. This picture shows that very well. Um, OK, now let's get into it. So Sarah uh, started with the jump tap data. I want to back up before the jump tap data. What you have to realize is Google has said for years now that more than half of the searches are mobile. So what that should mean to you is that if you're not paying attention to mobile rankings and mobile SEO, you're not doing your job. More than half of the searches are mobile. That's a lot. It's more than half in fact. So that's a big deal. But more than half of the searches don't get clicks. 61% of mobile searches don't generate a click, according to the jump tap study that Rand wrote up. That's a big deal. Lots of people were surprised by that. I wasn't surprised. But I think the SEOs were surprised because SEOs are still relying on desktop SEO tools that aren't providing accurate mobile rankings. Desktop SEO reporting tools, or just SEO reporting tools, don't give you good, accurate information about what's happening on mobile, because most of them just say mobile. They don't tell you Android or iOS. They don't tell you what kind of phone, what size screen. They don't tell you where they assume the phone is standing, and that can change results, right? We know when we search on a phone that where you are when you search changes the results, especially for local. So when 
I'm in an SEO tool and it says mobile. I'm like, what does that mean? What do you mean when you say mobile? Tell me. But most SEOs just take it for granted and say, oh, this is mobile. So I think that's maybe like the SEO tools aren't giving you the data, but you're just assuming that, that it's right. But it's often not. But in reality, those numbers hardly even matter, right? Because in mobile, like, what does a ranking in position four mean if you're below an app pack, a map pack, an amp carousel, and a recipe carousel, or something like that? Like, there's so much goodness packed into the top, and the carousels, like, how do you count a carousel? And do you count knowledge graph? Do you not? There's so much awesomeness that being in position four be below blue links versus being in position four between lots of good awesomeness is totally different. So you couldn't even compare. Doesn't matter. The numbers wouldn't even matter. So the other thing to know is that the top is just of mobile is just dominated by really, really cool stuff. And, and this is why that 61% just aren't clicking. They're getting the answer in, in the result. They don't need to go further. And, and this is, of course, Knowledge Graph gives you so much information. Knowledge Graph is the perfect example because it gives you exactly what you need a lot of the time, but also it's different in mobile because in desktop, it's up to the right. It doesn't push anything away. It doesn't take position one. In mobile, it totally does. It pushes stuff way down. Changes the rankings, totally. There's zero position one because it's way, way down. Desktop, you still have a position one that might be a website. Uh, carousels, sometimes knowledge graph kinds of carousels or related things carousels, all these different kinds of carousels that Google is testing that look great. People want to click these. Answers, give people the answer that they're looking for right away. They're lifted from websites with pictures, sometimes uh, videos, Q&A, all this stuff. Videos that play directly from the search results. All of this stuff is giving people what they need without having to get to your website. And it's especially prevalent in mobile. Stone Temple did a study that showed that there are something like 32 different kinds of inclusions that can show up in mobile. They often show up at the top. Everything that shows up in mobile is also very likely to, to occur in voice. And the occurrence of these things are growing over time. So this is a progression from 2016 to 2018. And the occurrence of these kinds of results is growing in both voice and mobile results. And there are 32 different kinds of things that can steal position one that Google's throwing in there. So if you're wondering where all the websites went, they went down. They're being displaced by Google's content. What you have to understand here is that the web is changing and most SEOs are missing the point because if you're doing old school SEO, it's not gonna work anymore, especially for the more than 50% of searches that are happening on mobile. You need to understand that mobile first indexing is not just about websites. And what I do, and the reason I think I might be good at understanding where Google is going, is I follow the money. And I know that Google's been doubling down on artificial intelligence and a bunch of stuff that doesn't have screens, right? Google Home, Chromecast, Chromecast Music, um, Google Assistant that, that's meant to be interacted with in voice. And spoiler alert, when you search on these things, Google's not just going to list 10 blue links. And even if they did, how would you click? And even if you could click, what would Google do when it got to the website? Websites don't work without screens. Google's put so much time and effort and money into Google Assistant and Google Home. 400 million devices in 2018 have been sold with Google, Home, or Google Assistant on board. TVs, everything. Because the, the hardware is cheap. The technology is in the cloud. They're putting it in everything. But websites won't work with it. They just don't work. If you're just focusing on websites, you're going to miss out. Google wants you to focus on one thing for mobile first indexing, and that is this change, the crawler. We went from having the desktop crawler being primary to the mobile crawler being primary. And they say, 
We've changed the primary crawler. Now mobile crawler is doing the indexing. And they're still going to crawl desktop-only sites. But what you need to focus on is making sure mobile and desktop match each other. That's it. Schema, links, all those things, they just need to match. So what's the big deal? Like, how in the world did that take more than two years? They pre-announced this update more than two years ago. But it shouldn't take two years to change the primary crawler. Google used to change the primary crawler user agent all the time without an announcement. It was just a casual thing they did as, as screens evolved and stuff like that. They just did it. It wasn't a big deal. And why are they calling this indexing when really what they've done is changed crawling? That's weird. What I want you to do is not get sucked in by the weird Google communication on this topic, because it's a distraction. It's a red herring. It's not really what you need to know to move forward. It's really about entity-first indexing, the stuff that's taking the clicks away from your websites. So let's break it down. What's an entity? An entity is an idea or concept. It's actually something that's primary to keywords. Keywords describe entities, but entities can exist without keywords. Entities are language agnostic. So for instance, if we have a blue chair, the blue chair is a blue chair, regardless of what language I say blue chair in. Okay? Uh, entities, we can list. They're ideas, and they're kind of stagnant. Uh, we have a, a picture of books here, because it's kind of like an encyclopedia. The encyclopedia lists all of these things, and it's people, businesses, concepts. They're kind of static. And Google has this already. They have the knowledge graph. And it's a list of entities, things, ideas, people that are worthy of being understood. And they, you can even now link to them, or they'll show you links that are static. Um, they've started putting the little share triangle links in the search results. So that's what an entity is. What is indexing? We covered this last year, but let's review. An index is just an organization of a lot of information, a way to organize massive amounts of information. And there are lots of different ways to organize massive amounts of information. This picture is a picture of books that are indexed on color. They could have been indexed on author. They could have been indexed on topic. They could have been indexed on title. But they're indexed on color. The important thing here to understand is just because we change how we've indexed or organized them doesn't mean we've changed the books themselves. And this is the point that Google makes. There's one index, and the content is, cha is not changing. They're just reorganizing it to make their lives easier, more efficient. So I believe, and not everyone believes this, some smart people disagree, I believe that Google's index used to be organized on the link graph. But I think that got too cumbersome, because there's so much data being created every year. 90% 90 of, 90 of the world's information was created in the past two years, and that statistic is like two years old. So it's probably even more. I have, they haven't updated that statistic. So it's probably even more. Data is being created at an increasing pace, because there are so many different ways of tracking as sensors uh, with data, right? And Google's goal is to organize the world's information, but we're creating more and more information. But Google's goal was not just to organize the world's websites. And the link graph was only good at websites. And it's not efficient to keep crawling as there are more and more things to crawl, and it gets older, and we start redirecting, and they have to follow all the redirect chains from the beginning of time. It's not efficient anymore. It was interesting when the web was new. It's not working anymore. That's broken. Google can crawl websites, and they will probably continue to crawl websites. But there are more efficient ways to get information that is updated more readily, feeds, APIs, databases. And a lot of the stuff that Google wants to index doesn't have URLs, things like videos, native apps. PWAs don't necessarily have to have separate URLs for all the content. Audio, businesses, like small businesses, um, utilities, Internet of Things, these things don't need URLs to exist. We're forcing them to right now, but they don't. It's, it's a cumbersome requirement that's unnecessary. They could just exist with APIs. 
It's easier to organize these things based on entities, like the knowledge graph is a list of entities. And if we organize these concepts on the knowledge graph instead of the link graph, we're not forcing these concepts into something that they don't fit into. So to do this, Google had to re-understand the whole world. And they started with understanding language, because remember, entities are language agnostic. So they created the Cloud Natural Language API. This tool is fantastic for understanding what keywords Google pulls out of a sentence. You can actually drop, you can see I've put text from my homepage into this tool. Uh, you drop it in, and it'll show you what entities it recognizes from the text. And it'll show you what keywords it's totally ignoring. It's a great tool for SEO. It shows you how it understands and parses the text and finds the entities. It shows you how the words relate to each other in the sentences and how it understands that. It had to do this so that it could get the understanding of the languages to index the entities correctly. They've totally reorganized. It's a new index. Uh, Market Finder is a great tool that they marketed to PPCs where you just drop in a URL and it tells you how this URL has been classified. What are the topics associated with this URL? You can see in mine, I did Chewy.com, which is a pet food or pet supply company, and it said dogs, pet food, treats. It did this in two seconds. It didn't recrawl it, it just knew. I think the domains have already been categorized and it's just returning the result of a pre-categorization in this tool. If you want to see how Google has your domain categorized, drop it in this tool. And FYI, this tool does not handle pages. It's categorizing you at a domain level. So entity results can be searched for or interacted with or cast in an eyes-free setting. And eyes-free is what Google uses to describe um, voice only. Uh, entities are things that Google can disambiguate. So you see at the top, uh, I searched for hound dog, and this is a confusing query for Google because it's like, oh, do you want the dog, or do you want the song, or do you want the movie? There are a lot of things. And if you think about it, when Google understands what are the possibilities associated with this keyword in a voice only query, it could actually ask me that question. It could say, did you mean this, that, or the other thing? But if it was just listing websites, it would be a really painful interaction. So why are entities so important? <clears throat> Basic entity understanding shows us the relationship of one thing to another. And it can be a brand to a topic to a subtopic, but it can also be a brand to another brand or a brand a version of a domain to the other international versions of the domain. It's a hierarchy or a relationship. If you think about Google like an encyclopedia, it's a see also, or people also searched for, related queries, related searches. This is the hierarchy. Google's giving you a peek into their understanding of the world when they show you the related searches. So entity indexing is topic indexing, but it shows you how different pieces of content are related to each other when they're not just websites. And this is important because it means that a query where they did show a website like this one for what time is it in Denver can turn into this one where they drop out all the websites because they know that you just don't need them. No one searching for what time is it in Denver is actually looking for a website. And remember, that's a great use case for a voice query, an eyes free query because websites wouldn't work if you asked a Google Home what time it was. And entity-first indexing allows Google to start modifying search results for context based on device. So that if you're searching in your car, it can show you a map result. And if you're searching from a assistant, Google Assistant-enabled TV, it can show you video. And if you're searching from a wearable, it can show you audio, or if you're searching from um, your laptop, it can show you all of the above. The problem is, as SEOs, we're used to working on the all of the above scenario. But you need to start thinking about what would it be like if someone were searching in a less sophisticated device where they don't have a keyboard or they don't have a screen because there are less options. And this is what Google cares about, where they're spending their time is now 
the less capable devices where there aren't screens. Google cares about this a lot, and you can tell because they're encouraging people to claim their personal entities, right? Now we can go and say, I'm an entity and I want to manage my, my presence in Google, or I manage this brand, and you can get verified for, as being a brand manager just by clicking the triple dots in Google. Google Posts is enabling small businesses to manage their entity understanding because re realized maps are just business entities. All the map and Google My Business things, just business entities. And I think you guys were used to Knowledge Graph showing domains of like official domains to the home page or maps showing links to the, the home page of the site. But what we're not used to that we need to get ready for is Knowledge Graph showing links to deep pages on the site, like what's happening right now with searches for the World Cup. This, both of these, when you click on the link, either on the left to the match preview or on the right to the FIFA World Cup for the Colombia-Japan match, that one's already happened, but when you click on those links, it's going to a deep page on the site. So the entity is wrapping around the links that you would be doing SEO for. Sad Rand. This is one of Rand's favorite examples. I hope he doesn't put it in his talk, but he might. Lego Ship in a Bottle is a product entity. And you can see on the left um, that it does have a lego.com uh, URL to the main domain. But on the right, it has all the competitive places where you can also buy this exact same product. So this is confusing. If you're marketing a product and you're lego.com, you're like, oh, awesome, lego.com, we're there. But wait, that's, how, what do we do about that? The world is changing, right, for SEOs. Um, so I've said for years that Google wants to be the presentation layer of the internet. And this is my friend David Mim, and he's always agreed, but he doubled down and he said, no, Cindy, Google wants to be the transaction layer of the internet. And I couldn't agree more. This example shows a Target branded map pack, and that's new, number one, the branded map packs, thanks to Greg Gifford for showing me the first branded map pack we ever saw. Um, now they're much more common. But, so this branded map pack for Target, kind of cool, but if you look, they've added a products tab. You can buy products from Target's map pack. What? Who's done that? Anyone? Bought from the map pack? It's done through a Google shopping action. This is a new way that Google's monetizing things. And um, it's, it's a whole new thing. Google wants to be the transaction layer of the internet. And, and entities can even be followed, right? That was Target. What if I followed Target like I followed DSW in the Chrome feed? You can hit the plus button and follow entities so that you don't even have to search for them. Google will just kind of notify you by adding things to your Chrome feed. And if I follow DSW, do you think they're going to tell me about sales, especially if they're set up for shopping actions? Yeah. Yeah, they are. So why is entity-first indexing great for Google? Well, it's just good for business. Um, entities are hosted and understood without having to be crawled and recrawled, without having to verify whether something is a good link or a paid link. Um, they're easier to parse out of really long, crazy voice queries like you might get from a kid. Um, but mostly, they're easier to monetize. Traditional PPC has funded Google for a long time, and it's done a good job. But there are higher profit margins when Google monetizes maps, media, and shopping queries. And we've already seen this happening all over the place. I just want to focus mostly on entertainment and, shop and media, because this is sneaky. But think about <clears throat> all the media you consume, and think about cable cutters. How many of you pay for a cable subscription? Maybe you guys are shy, but that's not many of you. Lots of people are canceling their cable subscriptions because they're watching media online. 
The amount, the amount of data consumed by video on the internet is huge and growing, and internet video just surpassed TV video in terms of eyes on ads for t uh, compared to TV. More eyes on web ads than TV ads. Lots of money to be made here, and Google didn't want it to go to anyone else, no one of, none of these competitors, <clears throat> so they've monetized it. They sell media in the, the media, they sell streaming ads, they rent the videos, they rent or sell the videos, the content, all of it, and they have uh, licensing agreements, all of these things, they're monetizing the media in lots of different creative ways that you're not thinking about because it's not PPC, but they're making loads of money here. Same thing with podcasts. Podcasts are growing like crazy. Google said they want to double the amount of podcasts out there, and podcasts are fantastic for Google because they work in an eyes-free environment, and they're full of Q&A that Google can parse to show as answers in a voice query, because Google can parse out the questions and answers in a podcast. Music, people love consuming streaming music. Most people don't download music anymore. And Google can monetize that just as easily. If you think you're safe because you have books, or you publish books, wrong. Google's monetizing books like crazy, and magazines, too. Look at this last one. They showed a spelling like typo correction below a book carousel. Crazy. So what do you do as an SEO? How do you leverage entity-first indexing? You need to focus on being a multimedia, multimodal company and make your content engaging, not just in a website context, but associate all of your components, anything that you create that's not just website stuff, to the entity. Make sure that Google understands that it's part of your brand. And there are all these content, uh, content types that Google's written up in their documentation, that column on the left, article, book, course, data set, event, fact check. It's all schema markup that you can use in and outside of your website, podcast, product, recipe. You don't have to put it on your primary site. It just has to be entity associated with the, the main uh, brand. In apps, they straight up, they have the same list basically, and they just call it indexables. That's your hint. Indexing, indexables. It's all coming together. If you've been here before, you know this is Will Reynolds. This is real company shit. This is the new quality signal, not links. So do these things, build this stuff out, use the language tools to understand when Google sees entities and when they don't. We have some mobile tools that you should check out, and that's it.